Hello, and welcome to the Victoria Forum. I'm Saul Klein, Dean of the Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria and Chair of the Victoria Forum. Established in 2017, the Victoria Forum brings together change makers in the search for solutions to the pressing problems facing our people and our planet. The Victoria Forum will bring together uh, policymakers, business leaders, academics, youth community groups, non-governmental organizations, and indigenous communities to generate ideas for a better world. We are at a time right now where humanity is facing critical environmental problems. With the pandemic that we are currently facing, we are seeing a change in the climate as humanity is being forced to live a cleaner and healthier life. We have given Mother Earth a chance to heal, but we need to continue our efforts to protect and preserve her, not only for our own sakes, but for our future generations. Our discussions are intended to be evidence-based and inclusive of different perspectives, but united by a common purpose of wanting to make a difference. As our country's chamber of sober second thought, the Senate is a perfect partner for this enterprise. I am delighted to be part of the advisory team uh, that is putting together the Victoria Forum. And I very much look forward to these discussions and look forward to your participation. I hope we can all look forward to continuing the conversation and developing solutions for a better world at the University of Victoria. Thank you. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous à ce dixième webinaire, un webinaire uh, en quelque sorte anniversaire uh, du Forum de Victoria. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. Uh, it's a bit of an anniversary today as we're hosting, holding our 10th uh, webinar since uh, early May, always on the theme of uh, bridging divides and today perhaps one of the most important divides, the gender gap. Aujourd'hui, euh, notre, notre mandat au cours de cette série de webinaires, c'est d'explorer euh, les clivages et de chercher à combler euh, les clivages. Et le thème du jour, euh, c'est l'écart entre les genres. Et euh, c'est un, euh, un des clivages importants. Et on est ravis euh, que vous soyez avec nous aujourd'hui et ravis d'avoir euh, ce panel. My name is Sébastien Beaulieu. I'm Canada's ambassador to Senegal. And the Victoria Forum. Je m'appelle Sébastien Beaulieu, je suis ambassadeur du Canada au Sénégal en Afrique de l'Ouest, au président associé uh, du Forum uh, de Victoria. We have a great panel, but we also have uh, great participants from around the world uh, joining us today from uh, some 20 countries, une vingtaine de pays représentés, a truly global uh, conversation today. Um, the Victoria Forum is a partnership between the University of Victoria and the Senate of Canada. And we're pleased to have uh, a senator uh, with us uh, today as a panelist. Et puis, uh, en français, uh, le Forum de Victoria, c'est un partenariat novateur entre UVic et uh, le Sénat uh, du Canada. Today's panel and today's session is brought to you uh, in partnership with Intisar Foundation and the Busara Center. Um, on that note, I will hand it over now to Marika Schumers, uh, VP of the Busara Center. Over to you. Thank you very much. Merci à tous. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, when we looked at the participants list, it became very clear that we need to account for all kinds of time zones. We appreciate you calling in today from all over the world and really to do this, to join a conversation on gender and gender during the times of the pandemic. Um, I will give a few kind of introductory remarks of how we thought about this session before handing over to our fantastic speakers. I think one thing that has really struck me over the past six, seven months that we have now been in in the COVID pandemic is that just how much COVID has turned out to be a time of contrast. And this is interesting if you think back of the very early days of the pandemic, which now seems almost decades ago, where sometimes the assumption was voiced that this could be an equalizing disease because everyone could get sick, countries were affected in the same way. And yet what we have seen time and time again is that actually 
how you are affected by a situation is always dependent on where you are and who you are and what your situation is when you start. And we see the same thing about the experience of women in the pandemic. One thing I find fascinating about COVID is that it, it forces us to think about identity in a different way. We can almost think about COVID identities because we have identities play out in very different ways than we have before. And maybe there's a major division that we can make in these COVID identities and how people have, have experienced it, is, which is the people who are able to adapt by continuing what they're doing in better ways and the people who need to adapt without a choice of how they can continue to do the things they do. They just need to do the same things, but under more and more difficult circumstances. And let me say, let me elaborate what I what I mean by that. I mean that in this vast category of women all over the world affected by COVID-19, we have all kinds of different experiences. Women who have experienced this time as a time of shift and change, but also new opportunity as they were able to maybe move a lot of their lives online and expand social networks in the, that way, in contrast to women whose worlds and social spaces have shrunk because their lives have become more and more difficult and they have less opportunity or no opportunity, no access at all to have these mitigating measures using technology. We see that women are able to take up new educational opportunities because they can move online and others are missing out on opportunities to be educated in a, in a great and very dramatic way. We see that economic hardship can sit side by side with economic opportunity again as women are able to deal with this situation in very different ways. However, we can also say categorically that women are hit much harder by this. We see that women's jobs are less secure than men's job, and it's estimated that women's poverty in particular will increase by about 10% globally. Many women are struggling to access healthcare for themselves or for their family, while ironically, many women are also the ones providing that very healthcare, providing unpaid care, often providing healthcare in professional settings with very low pay and without the right equipment. And many, many women need to manage a family staying at home, homeschooling children, providing meals on maybe ever shrinking budgets and not necessarily being safe in their own homes. I want to just remind us that in a couple of weeks, we're marking the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1324, the famous Women, Peace and Security. And I don't want to elaborate on this, but I do think it reminds us of a few things. It reminds us of the fact that in a crisis, in a difficult situation, women are disproportionately and uniquely impacted that a gender perspective highlights the special needs of women and girls during different times of crisis and that women's participation needs to be facilitated and protection needs to be acknowledged. So we start this conversation in the spirit of the Victoria Forum, which is about bridging divides, about trying to understand what an experience is to then be able to figure out what solutions could be to support situations that are very, very difficult to handle. And we do this vastly different and that because of that fantastic perspective we look at the very high policy level we look at very specific initiatives of how to support women who come or still are in a times of crisis we look at an anthropological view that looks at long long-term changes to social norms and the experience of women over generations and we look at maybe the underlying questions to all of this which is how do we actually know what the experience of women in this pandemic really is and what do we need to improve to improve our knowledge so with that i'm really to welcome our wonderful panel i will introduce the speakers as they come on we have a round of first initial we hope for a lively discussion with all of you and i'm delighted to first hand over to my co-champion of this um, session her highness sheikha indisa al saba and um, welcome. She is a wonderfully influential figure in Kuwaiti society and has been a lifelong champion for women's rights, for peace and security. Sheikha Intisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Maraika. And as you rightly said, we've all suffered or been affected by the pandemic in one way or the other. And uh, our vulnerable women in the Middle East have suffered, I think, more than Western women because no, they're 
now living in even smaller quarters because they can't go out. They already live in very small houses. They've got children and they have very little access to technology. On top of all of that, there is a lot of violence at home. So all of this makes it very difficult for them to um, thrive, yet they are. Let's say our women are, and uh, we, we see a lot of this. They're used to the shock, they're used to the pain, but they're also used to getting on with life. They're used to finding a solution, and that's the only thing that gives us hope is, unfortunately, they're used to it, and fortunately, they're used to it. So they, they are finding ways to cope, they're finding ways to get on with in, in life, and uh, we do virtual sessions, virtual psychological sessions, and now we do it with the women from their homes. And uh, I, I'll give you the case of one woman who is so scared of her husband that she sits in front of the the phone but she sits in front of the phone and she answers us by blinking because she cannot say anything in front of him the good thing is she is courageous enough to sit in front of the phone to make the effort to to do it and this is what gives me personally hope is the more we build their capacity inside the more they're able to bridge that gender divide, the more they're able to stop the, the psychological and the physical abuse they ha they ha they're suffering at home, the more they're able to grow as women. I'm, I'm all for psychological support and I'm all for in humanitarian work, in emergency humanitarian work, not keeping it with three, but four, food, shelter, health medicines and psychological support. I'm going to repeat that and repeat that and repeat that until all aid agencies, all countries know that you cannot only provide the three, food, shelter and medicine. We have to support the people psychologically. Only by doing that, we can reduce the trauma they suffer during wars, during crises, during any kind of shock. Because if we don't do that, the suffering will continue. We cannot give them food and they're scared. We cannot give them medicine and they're scared. We cannot give them shelter and they're scared. They have to release the trauma because the trauma is passed down the generations. If we don't support them from the beginning, it's going to be harder and harder when the trauma is really impacted and it stays further and further inside the body for them to release it. Women are the biggest victims of war, big, biggest victims of any catastrophe. And unfortunately, they're the last ones we look at. And when we support one woman, she's able to support a whole family and the community. Yet, we forget that. So, um, if there's one call of action that I would like is we all have to change our policies, our humanitarian aid policies, our women empowerment policies, our gender divide policies to include psychological, but true psychological support for women, community support for women. We can't just talk to their minds. Their cognitive mind does not understand when the trauma is in their body emotions. We have to take the triangle. If we could show the triangle, uh, please. We, it's a triangle that it doesn't, you know, we have to unravel the whole triangle. So it has to start with the body, then go to the emotions, and at the end, go to the cognitive and narrative. Unfortunately, all so far, most psychological support goes to the cognitive and the narrative or the emotions and forgets that it's a triangle that has to be unraveled together. Then we release trauma. So I'll end my talk saying we need to really focus on the psychological support for women because from our experience, when we support the women psychologically, they naturally remove the divide they have with men. And we've seen it time and time and time again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Her Highness Sheikha Intisa Al-Sabah.
it's a good reminder, I guess, about the you know, thinking about a holistic approach when we when we try to unpack what is the nature of women's experience in the pandemic, what is the diversity in this experience, and what elements need to be considered in supporting women individually, as you just mentioned, or as broader groups, and for example, thinking about broader economic support, um, etc., which is a, a wonderful segue to the Honorable Jane Cordy, um, Senator for Nova Scotia. Jane Cordy has been in the Senate, in Canada Senate for close to 20 years, or 20 years, and she's particularly interested in the question of gender and security and has dealt with this on the very high international policy level, for example, as the past chair of Can the Canadian NATO Parliamentary Association. And um, I wonder, Jane, whether you can take us through from some of the thoughts from Intisa about the kind of individualized considerations that need to be in place to help women to the high policy level. How does something like this translate to discussions of gender and security, of, of considerations of women's protection needs and what kind of support actually helps women who find find themselves in very, very difficult situations. Thank you very much, Marika. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be, what time of the day it happens to be. And my colleague, Jim Munson, who you saw earlier on the tape, uh, a colleague of mine in the Senate, has done a tremendous job of promoting the Victoria Forum. So before being appointed to the Senate, I was an elementary school teacher in Nova Scotia for about 30 years. And when I first started teaching in the 1970s, when a woman became pregnant, she had to leave work after three months because they didn't want the children seeing a pregnant woman, which was a little bit unusual. But the head of the school board at the time rationalized it by saying that that the reason was the pregnancy was a self self-inflicted injury. Now, I still haven't figured that one out at my grand old age, um, but we see that we have come a long way since the, since the 70s, but we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly highlighted the challenges for families and particularly for women. And uh, I have been a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, for quite a while, and I'm a member of the Civil Dimension of Security Committee within the Assembly, and we're working currently on draft reports, one of which is the impact of COVID-19 on the civil dimensions of security. The UN uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda is designed to ensure women's full, equal and meaningful participation in peace negotiations, humanitarian activities, peace operations and post-conflict uh, peace building. And NATO works to implement this agenda. It has been reported and we all know that COVID-19 has been having a disproportional impact on women. Their economic security is declining and their unpaid care work is rising. Combine that with the loss of income, stress, and of course, orders to stay at home, all of which may be contributing to an increase in gender-based violence. Sometimes many of us can forget that being forced to stay at home is not the safest situation for some women and for some children. These situations can certainly increase stress levels and in fact may put people in danger. And Shayeka uh, earlier spoke about the psychological care and one of my colleagues uh, in the Senate, Senator Dr. Stan Kutcher, who is a child psychiatrist, spoke out about, and I'll quote what he was speaking about, was the problems in delivering mental health care and the capacity for vulnerable people to successfully adapt have been prime victims of COVID. The NATO a parliamentary draft report on the impact of the COVID crisis refers to the risks the pandemic has placed on women around the world, violence against them, and the socioeconomic inequalities between men and women. It speaks about the measures to slow or stop the spread of COVID, which have led to an increase in violence against women. Alerts have been issued on the surge in domestic violence in China, in Europe, and in North America. We know that the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19 have affected women more than they've affected men. Many women are in informal employment and have no access to unemployment benefits, sick time, or medical benefits. School closures or students being sent home because of an outbreak in their school or because of a sore throat or cough increases the need for childcare. And not everyone has family members living close by to help out. Abacus data in Canada said that 960,000 Canadian parents had to miss work because their child was unable to go to school. And it might have been the child themselves, the, uh, the child who was sick, or it might have been somebody in their school or in their classroom. 
The report goes on to say that when this is over, and please let it be over soon, I thought it would be over this fall, it's still not over, we have to determine the lessons learned from the different national responses to the spread of the pandemic and its consequences. Comparative studies are essential. What works, what doesn't work. Vietnam, a country with 195 million people, has had 35 deaths as of last evening when I checked. South Korea, with 51.6 million, has recorded 438 deaths. Now, it's unlikely that these numbers uh, will remain the same, but, how they've, but we have to look at how they've stayed low for this amount of time. It's important that we share information. We know the COVID numbers would have been much lower if rep repressive policies were not in place in some countries. State control of information, restrictions on freedom of the press, and a lack of transparency impeded an international coordinated response to COVID-19. We know that whistleblowers were initially silenced and in some cases arrested, and all of these things must be examined. It is essential that we have international cooperation Operation and sharing of knowledge if we are to make changes in how re we respond to these type of events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, there were a lot of words in there that I think will ring very, very true to Professor Jock Madhu Jok, who's our next speaker, who has written more books than I can count, um, Professor of Anthropology at the Syracuse University in New York, books on security and governance, gender, social norms and gender, gender-based violence, and reproductive health primarily in, in the Sudans, but also more broadly in East Africa. And, and Jock, I wonder how what Jane said sounds to you, the idea of needing to learn lessons, needing to learn more about the interaction between types of regimes and the pandemic response and what it means. Maybe even the worry about not being able to school children in the Sudans. This, is, this comes from a very, very different starting point. These were worries even before the pandemic. How do you think this has now affected women, um, particularly in South Sudan, but also what are some measures that can be considered? What do we even know about the experience of women who live in these kind of multiple crises of war, poverty, hunger, and now also a global pandemic? Thank you very much, uh, Marika, and uh, thanks to everyone uh, who has tuned in. Um, so we know that uh, COVID-19 disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, exacerbating existing health inequities, economic inequities, uh, and most particularly along gender lines, uh, where we know that there are already pre-existing social uh, issues with the lack of information, uh, the types of occupation that uh, women uh, uh, fall in the station that women uh, are, uh, where they are stationed in the hierarchies of their societies, uh, definitely are magnified and, and exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, in other words, uh, even though COVID-19 seems to spare women in terms of the gravity of illness itself, as we know from, uh, at least in, in, in the global north, uh, the, 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 the death rates uh, from COVID are much higher among men, and there are many explanations, public health and otherwise, to this reality. The, the, the fact is that the public health measures themselves the, that were instituted to combat have landed on a fertile ground of gender difference. These differences don't favor women. So, for example, in formal economies uh, in Africa, in most particular in Ghana or in Nigeria, uh, Senegal and Togo and all these places, these informal economies uh, suffered the greatest during shutdown, during the, the, the lockdown. In, uh, in North America, for example, essential work, the, the so-called essential work is mainly done by black women and brown women. Uh, in the U.S., for example, uh, sh um, packing the shelves, uh, working uh, cashiers in the groceries, and uh, and 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 uh, uh, orderlies in the in 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 
in, in hospitals and so forth. These are essential work that, have, that were not locked down. Uh, and yet they are uh, done by women and uh, ex expose them a great deal to this risk. Uh, closure of schools in East Africa uh, has left girls very vulnerable to exploitation. And if you can just think about some of the basic mundane things that sometimes we take for granted that we, girls have to deal with, uh, they become magnified during this time. For example, in Nairobi, in some of the slums uh, like Kibera or Madare, you will find that uh, girls who have not been able to go to school during this shutdown are definitely vulnerable to exploitation by older men uh, for very basic things sometimes. Uh, just uh, enough money to buy sanitary pads uh, can, uh, can expose girls to these uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so the closure of schools has and, and uh, particularly uh, very vulnerable to these things. There are also anecdotal reports uh, from East Africa about domestic violence having increased uh, against women and uh, but, but children in general as well. So what the pandemic has done here is that it has unveiled these inequities uh, that uh, we knew always existed but uh, sometimes because they have been such a mundane and they are uh, become part of life, uh, sometimes they have not been highlighted from time to time, but, but the pandemic came and has made them more visible. Uh, and this uh, should now guide uh, policy decisions with regards to making services more equitable. Um, just to think that perhaps in, uh, when a pandemic comes, it comes with all the Perhaps there is a silver lining. There is a, a, a glimmer of hope that uh, these inequities, now maybe it, it, it reminds us to think about how to bridge these, these inequities. Um, for example, uh, uh, if women, uh, uh, the usual offers that uh, countries try to make to bridge the gap, uh, these, these offers that countries, governments make uh, are often driven by a sense of uh, making up for, for past mistakes, uh, more like political correctness as a way to, uh, as being nice to women. But in, in fact, what I'm saying as a result of the pandemic, we should rethink how we try to bridge the gap, not, not, not as a, a matter of being nice to women, but seeing it as being the welfare of the whole. Uh, if women fare well in pandemics and other crises, the whole society fares better. So instead of attacking these inequities from the point of view of being nice to women, and, and this is a story that goes back to, to, to the UN resolution that uh, Marika mentioned, uh, 1325, uh, that it is not, it's not about being accommodating of women. It is about really seeing that the whole country, the whole society, the whole human family moves forward when women have been given a playing field uh, in addressing these issues. And, and to the story of AIDS uh, pandemic, you will also see that the efforts to combat AIDS have given women uh, a platform to be heard, to be champions of the rights of their, of their own on the whole, not just women and not girls, but for everyone. So I think it should be seen as an effort uh, not to be nice to women, but an effort to give women the, their constitutional, their, their human rights uh, platform so that they can become contributing members of their societies for the welfare of the whole. There should be a deliberate policy decisions to support uh, women economically in order to withstand any future uh, evolution of this disease, because we are now seeing that this disease is evolving all the time. And, and perhaps, uh, or other pandemics in the future. So the pandemic has also armed governments. Uh, this is what we see now in East Africa, especially uh, security agencies uh, to steal back any civic space previously gained, uh, especially in less democratic societies um, with closure of schools and with the uh, lockdown of economies, uh, rural women in South Sudan uh, suffer the greatest because uh, these are informal uh, economies uh, that can only mean that a person is able to get a daily meal by working in a, in, in a crowded space. So if you, if you shut that down, 
not only is the woman losing the job, the whole family suffers. So uh, be the, the looking at the different policies to bridge the gap should be from the point of view of women being equal contributors to their societies and not as people who should benefit from men of male-dominated societies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dokman Dutok. And it, it's an important reminder, I think. It seems an obvious point to make, but it is often forgotten that gender equality isn't solely about making women's lives better, but actually we know that it makes everyone's lives better. It makes societies better. I was struck by something else that you said. Um, you started off by saying, we know that the pandemic has affected women worse than it has affected men. And then you also pointed out that there are reports, we have very little true empirical information on violence. And that is a perfect segue to um, Anisha Singh, who is the Director for Research and Innovation at the Bhusara Center, who thinks about how we can conduct research that takes into account what truly inclusive data actually needs to look like. Um, welcome, Anisha. I wonder how what Jock said sounds to you when we say we know that the pandemic has affected women in worse way than men's. But but do we really? What do we what do we need to know really about women's experience during this time of COVID? Thank you, Marika, and thank you everyone who joined today. I completely picked up on the same point that Professor Jock mentioned. Uh, and I want to quickly start with an example of what this lack of information and this gender data gap actually means for women across the world. So in the current pandemic, there's a pretty big gap in how women and men experience the medical system. And I think everybody on the panel has mentioned that so far. Uh, we know, and this is for a fact, we know that over 70% of health workers around the world are female, yet PPE um, gear used during COVID has been designed to be unisex. But like when you come to it, what does unisex really mean, right? Because of the lack of female specific data that we've been collecting for many decades now, unisex has come to mean that it's designed to fit the face and body shape of a traditional male figure. Um, and obviously that's clear, more and more women are coming forward and their doctors, nurses, frontline health workers raising the same issue. Um, and they've complained that even the smallest size of PPE has has been just far too big for them. Their clothing gets caught in equipment, they trip over. Um, and of course, if it's loose and ill-fitting, there's a less effective barrier against the virus itself. I think that's a pretty stark example of how we use data and how we've been designing based on the data we have um, and how it leads to like a big gap between the genders that obviously needs to be bridged. Um, so what can we really do to gather information and equally importantly, uh, use that information to actually create better policies? Uh, I just wanted to share maybe three over overarching thoughts here. Uh, the first is that we don't actually ask enough exploratory questions. Uh, Marika made a point, I think, earlier on, on some women have been able to move their lives online and expand their horizons through education and access to other uh, facilities versus some women whose worlds are shrinking social spaces because of the COVID restrictions. And the fact is that this sentence plays out so diff differently on the ground, depending on the groups of population. Uh, for example, social space Spaces used to be a coping mechanism for women um, and it, it formed the entire support system. So for those who can't access the virtual world, they're probably facing an even greater challenge than we've anticipated so far. But the problem goes back to what Professor Jack and Marika, you pointed out, that we can't accurately, accurately estimate this because we don't collect enough nuanced data. We do, we have started emphasizing uh, gender disaggregated data, but that's not enough because it considers women to be this block of data rather than slicing them up by different demographic, different psychographic factors that would actually help us to identify what are the unique challenges that different groups of women face uh, during the pandemic these days. And more importantly, we also need to figure out how to collect that information in the first place in a way that doesn't systematically leave women out. And that brings me to my second point, which is that we don't account for asking information in a way that women want to and can be asked. Uh, we need more ways that encourage women to want to share information that overcome their own barriers of privacy see competing priorities, cultural factors, all of that. We tend to use the same approach when we collect census data, large population data sets, even more stylized data for specific research questions. However, it's pretty fair to say that men and women can't be reached in the same way when we want to ask them these questions. Uh, women have different mental models, their lived experiences are different, their inhibitions in sharing information are different as well. Um, and I think we're starting to see that with the pandemic, we've seen a number of innovative ways to reach women and actually collect 
collect data about gender-based violence. And I'm hoping we can start using those same methods or at least exploring different methods for a variety of topics going forward. Uh, I think this goes back to the point Shekha and Tissar also made on understanding women's communication through eye blinking and all these other variety of factors um, that you wouldn't have maybe even thought of before that were needed. Uh, lastly, to, to really bridge the gender divide, I think the bridge has to go both ways. Um, we all are pretty guilty of this, that once we have information, once we have data, once we have a set of findings, we sit and we create policies uh, and interventions, and then we roll these out or we scale them up, but we don't, and these policies don't always work, and we often wonder why. Um, so for the bridge to actually go both ways, we've seen that a more participatory approach is more successful, one that relays policies and interventions back to populations. It asks women for their feedback on the policy itself. It asks women for their feedback on how it should be implemented to make it more useful for them, and that in a way also helps to create an open loop of information, uh, one that seems to be missing at this point. So yeah, Marika, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Um, Anisha, we now have some time, precious time to discuss with the panel. And I would like you all who have dialed in from all over the world, um, I would like to encourage you to ask your questions. The way to do this is by typing them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be monitoring that and you can pose questions directly to one of the panelists or indeed to the panel as a whole. Um, I, I want to start by something that really struck me in what you just said, Anisha, and may, maybe the question is posed best to, to Jane Cordy, really, which is that, that better policies require better information and the understanding of what better information means has improved a lot in the past few years but as Anisha highlighted we're nowhere near actually collecting the kind of data that would help us but I wonder Jane whether you can talk us through how how these two actually connect this really granular data this trying the also the work that Jock does and that Indusa do and the, at the very kind of grassroots level understanding almost individual experiences and then building international policies on that, policies on the grandest scale that by definition need to lump experiences together again. Have you seen attempts to do this in a way where you feel, yes, this really bridges a divide, this really moves the whole agenda forward in meaningful ways? That's a really good question. And if I, if I had all the answers, I'd be able to write a book, I'm sure. But I think that ultimately communication is is the key to all of this. Um, you know, we, we looked at um, the need from the NATO perspective, we were looking at the the idea of uh, communicating with of, of dousing fires of communicating so that misinformation that's out there is stopped immediately. Uh, because somehow misinformation seems to get so much more airplay than than the actual facts. So I think that's one thing is that we have to make sure that we respond to miscommunications. Uh, and whether that's, uh, whether that's, you know, we looked at it from NATO countries responding to countries that are, are, are repressive, um, but that could start I, and I think all of these tend to start at the, the ground. You know, when I look at my small province of Nova Scotia, we only have four cases in Nova Scotia. And those four cases are from people who traveled outside of Nova Scotia. We have a two week. I'm currently on isolation because I was in Ottawa. You have to, to isolate for 14 days when you come back from outside the province. Those four, four people who have COVID are currently isolating. So it's the spread hasn't has not been. Been happening and I think initially our premier was on when this first started he and the chief medical officer were on television every single day and I think when people felt that they knew what was going on they were more ready to buy in to what the solutions would be and we know initially that the science said one thing and then it changed but but that's because we were learning as it was going on so i think communication is the key thing and i think anisha you you expressed it very well when you talk talked about communication being two ways it's great to get information and to develop policies which everybody and i've been in rooms where you think haven't we done a great job um but the the policies aren't don't work for everybody and I think also the points that were made about women aren't don't all have the same issues don't all have the same problems so certainly in Nova Scotia even within Canada in Nova Scotia where we have four cases is certainly different than when I was in Ottawa and things were you were you were I was actually quite nervous um, walking on the streets 
um, and and I know that they're also working very hard. Then you go outside the country, so it's so it's really different. So I think that we have to number one communicate, and number two that we have to remember that these bridges work both ways. That we can't sit in rooms and make decisions as politicians or medical people. That we have to look at what works for different groups, different groups of women, either around the world and even within our own communities and economics, a whole range of issues, why, why people need different, different things. Um, thank you. I've, one thing that I find amazing really is that in many ways, this pandemic, this great global shakeup that we're experiencing has taken us absolutely back to basics. And we've heard that a bit in many different contributions from the speakers that actually information and communication, as you just said, Jane, is crucial. And yet we are reminded just how much information is not an equally shared good. I'm really struck by, by Intisa's story about women being very confined in the way they communicate by Jock's um, remarks about how really basic needs aren't even met. So I wonder, Intisa, whether there are some, whether you see a silver lining in how access to information during this time can increase for women, access to communication, because at the same time, of course, we're battling a barrage of all kinds of rumors and myths about what, what COVID is and who is to blame. But how can this realization that actually access to information and communication is very much one of the things that is missing in this gap, how can that be addressed? Oh, thank you for that question. I'm going to take it back to our women because access to information on, on, on the pandemic, uh, because we were, we were forced, which is brilliant. Again, there's always a silver lining to everything. We were forced from week two of the lockdown to communicate with our women virtually through the phone and then later on um, through uh, video calls and Zoom. Imagine they learned Zoom because they want to connect and they want to have more information. So the more access they have to information, the more safe they feel. They were asking and throughout, we were very um, candid about what we had and all of that. And they didn't go into, oh, this is a conspiracy or anything like that. They just want to survive at the end. You know, the only ones who are saying conspiracy and the other ones who have a lot of time on their hands. But when you're in the middle of struggling to just float, you don't think of conspiracy, you think, how can I stay afloat? And our women, the more we interacted with them, the more we, we, we actually practiced ex our exercises virtually with them from week three and that and they I mean I've got tons of testimonials about how that kept them going they missed the camaraderie of their weekly sessions but even having virtual sessions having someone just ask about them kept them going otherwise they would have collapsed so um, access to what's going on in the world or what's going on in the pandemic is irrelevant when you're struggling to survive in a very small confined space with lots of children around you and you're scared for your life, for their life, and it's not, not an easy life. So all, the, all, all our women wanted was access to mental health, access to breathing, access to the outside world other than you know the one-sided tv they wanted to be engaged with and they wanted to be heard so yes access to information is very important but also access to information that make you feel good good is equally important thank you I, jock i wonder whether this discussion and the current um, phenomena that you're observing whether it fills you with hope that things are improving or whether it fills you with tremendous frustration that actually it's old issues and they're now just reappearing in a different way so i guess we we we've seen this in your work that there are you know women are always falling on the side of the disadvantaged but are there any is there anything that you see in this pandemic where this might shift is there anything in the debate that you can follow that points towards this idea that we're maybe starting to think about this gender divide in different ways, maybe even starting to think about really kind of seemingly ingrained and positive concepts like women's empowerment in a new way, because they've been around for a long time and they still seem to be 
full of empty words with less impact and maybe even because the idea of shifting power doesn't do exactly what you mentioned earlier which is that it makes everyone's life better right it just hands over power from one side to the other so i wonder where how this this current debate and the way you see this play out how this feels to you in connection to how women's roles were previously imagined i can mention uh, two things uh, that i think um, speak to the issue you raise and one is that um, political leadership all across the world has revealed inadequacy and perhaps even deliberate uh, attempt to use the pandemic for political ends and 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 the only the only people that i see pushing back on these things particularly on the african continent is that the number of women moving into uh, a space where they're pushing back on the on the 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 effort by the state to take advantage of the pandemic related restrictions to claim back a specific space women are very much visible in this in these spaces now so i think it has provided an opportunity for women to be heard politically because the 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 uh, whether you're talking about uh, bolsonaro in brazil or uh, donald trump in the united states or um, the torte in in the philippines you find that uh, the many of these political leaders are trying to use uh, the pandemic as a as a political uh, platform as a way to gain public office and so forth uh, but uh, the women are saying no this is about lives this is about human lives and i think uh, all we can do is amplify those voices that are being raised by women in response to this the second one thing is there are a million uh, people around the world who are refugees uh, and on refugee camps uh, from kakuma to to the Tanzanian uh, uh, refugee camp just outside the Doma and all these different places, majority of people living in these spaces are women. And there are things that they are doing to live with the, with the consequences of this pandemic. And there, there are lessons we can learn that we can, uh, that w whatever women have learned to, to live with this can be amplified and, 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 and brought to, to policy decisions at a much wider level. So I think um, while, there, while, while the impact is so daunting, uh, I think there are opportunities in here uh, that can be used to, to, to show, you know, the women are doing it. They are suffering, but they are doing it. They are struggling and, and their struggles can be, can be made uh, very more, more, much more prominent at a policy level. And we heard many amazing stories about what, what just how much women do and how much they, they're able to do with different situations. We have a question coming in, which I, I find intriguing because, of course, the role, the role of technology has been so prominent in this pandemic. And, of course, technology requires that you have access to it. And we've seen that actually all over the world. This was, you know, it was astounding to see really how unevenly spread, for example, internet access can be in many of the Western countries. It is not the case that every child and every girl that can't go to school easily has access to internet or a computer really anywhere in the world. So we have a question coming in. How broadly, what kind of policies can help to increase access to information and technology areas, particularly low-income households and rural areas? Are we overestimating the role that technology can play if we can't even provide it to anyone? I don't know whether that's a good question for Jock or for Jane. I can, I can only remark on this by saying, um, since, since there, there is definitely more visibility and more access, to technology that can improve lives, especially in pandemic times. Uh, in refugee camps, there are, there are girls who have studied very well up to high school, but they have no access to university. This could be an opportunity for big universities around the world to actually enroll refugee girls in their courses since it is only online anyway. So um, it, it might, be a, a good campaign to have to talk to the Harvards and the I, uh, MITs of this world and London and Oxford to say, give a few seats to refugee girls in, in refugee camps, since the, your courses are online anyway, the girls can, can, can earn a degree without ever stepping foot in the global north since immigration has become such a serious issue and, and people in Africa are not being allowed to travel to Europe, just give them some room in classes. I think that can be, uh, one one advantage that technology can bring 
to the benefit of girls. I remember someone telling me from Stanford University when they offered their first uh, MOOC, their mass open online course, and they offered the first exam, that the first person to come in from Stanford, so who wasn't from anywhere else in the world to pass the exam, came in at like level 250. 249 people were better than the first person from Stanford. And this person was highlighting that these were not people who would ever, ever been able to make it to Stanford, but now they could. And I find that such a stark reminder of the point that you just made, Jock. Um, a lot of it goes back to knowledge, right? There's need to even know that there are refugee girls who are ready to do this. And that goes back to many of Anisha's points. And again, we have a question, which is a very concrete one. And maybe Anisha, you can, you can dream. The question is by any of the organizations here, or maybe listening to establish data sets that that meet the kind of data responsive requirements that you outlined Anisha and that could then be made available in an open access format um, this is why I said Anisha you can dream what would that dream look like and what would it require to be fulfilled I can dream we can all dream at this point um, but so just quickly on the point that you raised on technology and like differential access, maybe I'll just touch on one point on that. Um, and I think because it also relates to how we collect information and how we pass information back, which is that there are points even in rural, even in low income homes at which you can feed information through, right? And it's really for us, as you said, to know that these refugee camps exist, to know that there are local health volunteers who are working on the front line for that particular county, for that state, um, and empowering them with the information and empowering them to be able to share it onward. And as Senator Cordy said, be able to counter misinformation that comes up at that point. Like those efforts, I think, are also a little on the lower side as we go around now, but that's a way to still get information to your genuine last mile um, since there is a technology divide. I think us trying to bridge our technology divide is probably not going to solve it as much as just bridging an information gap. And I think that feeds into like, do are any of the organizations here trying to make data sets? And as you said, Marika, I think it, it takes a, a lot to make it happen. And I hope that's why it hasn't happened so far, but I am hopeful that we the pandemic has sort of made us get out of our short-term approach and look at the long-term horizon a lot more. Um, I think there needs to be systematic investments and collaborations across the global south, um, as Professor Jock mentioned as well, with the global north, with um, various foundations, with various policymakers, like bringing everybody together and making investments in this space to actually collect that data in a way that it's uh, composition of lived experiences, but then in a way that's useful for policy um, as well. And I think we all too often exist in these silos where the researchers collect the data. It doesn't feed back to the policymakers in the best way. Policymakers collect their own set of data, which is devoid of like the situation on the ground. Um, and I think without all the organizations coming together, it's probably impossible. Um, but that's what it takes to build this sort of, to overcome years of the data a gap that exists. Thank you, Anisha. Well, I know that um, Intisa is optimistic and, and always ready to come up with ideas of how to address some of these things. So, Intisa, from what Anisha just said, does that sound possible to you? What could actually be put in place to, to make some of these pos things possible, to establish the kind of relationship that are missing and that have now become more established? Uh, let, thank you for that, uh, Marika. Uh, what I would like to add to what was just said was bridging the gap with the technology or with policy can come through more investment in technology. Uh, I'm not going to say all of the refugees have cellular phones, but the majority do. And the reason the majority do is the price of a phone is not so high. And that comes from investment in technology. Most of the refugees know how to go on Facebook or other platforms is because that's how they connect with their families. So the more we invest in technology, we don't need to do policies about uh, how to bridge through technology. The more that's invested in technology, the cheaper the price will be, the more access people will have to technology. There are very few, I haven't seen, without refugee women, I think only one or two didn't have access to a phone. 
and the rest all do. And now with, the, with everything being online, including their children's education, they're learning more and more about technology. They're forced to learn more. So giving them information, the only obstacle now is do they get top-ups for their data? That's all they need. So, and that's coming, I mean, uh, accessing uh, data or you know, buying a top-up is, is a fraction of what it used to cost a couple of years ago. So for me, I'm a forever optimist. I always find in any crisis, things happen and things get better. I'm not saying that things get brilliant. I'm just saying that things get better. And that, I mean, that's one of the things that keeps me going is to always know that things will get better. And, you know, anything we do will make things better. So for me, instead of working on a policy change, as, as Senator Cordy said, which might not make everyone happy, let's work on how to make technology accessible to everyone just by allowing startups to flourish more. Startups are the hackers of technology. So the more access we have to startups, our more startups have access to increase their, their hacking, the easier it is to bridge the technological divide. One thing that to me has been kind of a slow and maybe even crushing realization over the past few years of my life as, as a researcher is that a lot of these things that we expect to be game changers that are designed to really have transformative impact on people's and particularly women's lives turn out not to be. And I wonder whether there's a similar issue that uh, in, in the way technology is imagined, which is that it is a, a game changer that allows access to information. And whether actually we see also, again, COVID kind of puts the magnifying glass on this, just to how the extent to which information can divide, can be weaponized, can be used, the extent to which it can tear communities apart. This, I, I find this a really interesting and as I said, somewhat devastating realization that a lot of these the, the policies and the ideas that are supposed to bring social and other kind of economic progress haven't really worked in the way that they're supposed to. And I, I wonder, Jock, whether I can pose this question to you, whether there are certain kind of so-called game changers that you think have really done the opposite of what they were supposed to do and what can be done about that? Thank you. I, I think um, the, the key issue is really a, a change in the mindset. Uh, there was a question that was uh, posted there about the concept of women's empowerment. And, and, and this is a key question in terms of thinking about bridging the gap, uh, not as something that is offered to women, but as, as something that is to do with self-determination. And when you talk about self-determination, it's the, the self determining itself. It's not being given to you. And so um, uh, the key issue in, in, in in increasing the spaces that women occupy in a positive way, I think we really all need to engage in a, in a kind of a mental shift uh, from, from, from women being given to women being able to take what, that which is their space. Um, and I think uh, that's, that's, a, that's a starting point. Other things that have changed the situation really is actually presence of women in political office, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you, you might think that uh, one woman here or token woman there is not enough, but actually um, it is better to have a few in public office than none. And so um, uh, governments and countries uh, that have made these shifts such that there is significant number of women in the legislature, some significant women of women ministers like in Rwanda, uh, you've seen in, 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 in uh, there is no question that things improve when there are more, more, more women voices in the office or around the table. So I think this is a lesson that we can all take to the various countries to, to ensure that uh, even if you have to start with constitutional quota system where number of women are in, included in decision making, you can start there. Um, it's not a solution, it's not a total solution to have uh, affirmative action, but it's a beginning. Uh, and then from the point of view of affirmative action, uh, women now will that will invite a greater number of women uh, such that the space, the political space is equitable. And luckily we have a woman in high political office. 
I, I, I think what's, what's interesting to observe about women moving into high leadership positions is that there's kind of two schools of thought, I guess. One, the point that Jock just made, a few is better than none, and they can still make a difference. And then I guess another school of thought that says, actually, it's really very tough to try and make a change if you're one of few. And I wonder, Jane, whether you can talk us through what what kind of support is necessary for women to even be able to achieve what they're setting out to achieve once they have reached a position of high political office? It's a uh... It's a yes to both of your questions, which is a contradiction, uh, but indeed it is. It's very challenging. When I was first appointed to the Senate and our Senate in Canada is appointed and we have 10 representatives from Nova Scotia and I was uh, only the third woman since Confederation who had been appointed. Luckily, where I, say, where I sit now, we have three women from Nova Scotia. So having one third makes a big difference. That's not to say that my male colleagues were offensive or, or anything. That's just to say that it makes a difference having more women in a political body. Um, and that's at all levels of government. This is the federal government. But I, you know, I've heard from many women who are the harassment that they get day after day about what you wear or what your hair looks like or your makeup, like stupid, frivolous things that they get criticized for. Uh, the minister, former minister of environment just got uh, the, the things that were said to her online and being online is, can be somewhat anonymous. So women can be really get berated online and you don't even know who's doing it, but it certainly is not a great way to start your day. Um, so, so yes, we need more women. Absolutely. And yes, it is challenging for women to be in the political process. And that's why it's helpful in the Senate. I think if it's not up to 50% women yet, it's certainly getting close. And our prime minister has certainly uh, made an effort to, to appoint more women to the Senate. Um, technology, getting back to that point, if I can, it's an extremely powerful instrument. And um, it's, it's a reasonable price to have a cell phone that can, can connect you to the world. So, so it's really, really important. So, but when I look at how we use it, um, I, I look at my political hat, and then I look at having been a former teacher. And from a political perspective, we have to make sure that all areas of, of our countries have access to, to um, the internet because sometimes very rural areas or in the north of Canada, it can be very spotty. So we have to make sure that that is, that is available so that all, all Canadians, and, and we knew this was important before, but when you see the pandemic, it magnifies it. From the teacher perspective, there is so much information on the net and we really have to start and I know it's being done but we really have to start teaching young people and adults critical thinking there's so much there that you have to be able to filter out what's good what's not good so I think teaching children and adults critical thinking still skills is of utmost importance we have a question which asks about, you know, most of you or all of you have made the point that it's important to think about policies and that there are very concrete ideas of how policies can be improved. And yet not every politician will unequivocally support these kind of policies or will even put the emphasis on trying to understand what the experience of women is during the pandemic, but more broadly. And the question is, well, what what can individuals do? What can individual citizens do to make their own political representatives more aware of these issues, maybe in their own countries, but maybe even beyond? I wonder whether there are insights from, from Jane, from Intersau, of what, what reaches the authorities? What, what makes voices heard at the highest political levels? Volume. Volume is number one. If you get one email, you think, oh, yeah, that's really interesting and, and it's important and you'll respond if you get hundreds and hundreds of emails or phone calls about an issue, just more than a, a, a verbal or a, a response. It better be an action. And going back to what Sheikha said earlier, like, what are we going to do about this? So I think the volume speaks. So if you've got, uh, if you've got, um, if you're involved in organizations, get them to reach out to the, the politicians from your district and, and nationally. Um, 
what I, oftentimes you'll get hundreds of letters that are absolutely identical. And when I speak to groups, I say, I love to get all your emails, but if I get 500 emails that are absolutely identical, I think nobody feels this strongly about it. They've only taken a letter that somebody gave them and copied it and sent it. And I said, put it in your own words. You don't have to be a professor from a university to write it. I just want plain language. I want to know what's the problem. What do you think the solution should be? So don't feel intimidated that you're, you don't have a university degree and I can't write to my member of Senator, just get that out of your head. We want to hear what the average citizen has to say. More helpful if it is your letter written by you. And if there are grammatical mistakes or spelling mistakes, I don't care. Uh, I just want to know what your message is. I want to give you a case of what's happening in Kuwait. So the women were giving the votes just a few years ago. And uh, we, 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 the first time I think we had four female parliamentarian members, everyone was happy, things didn't go very well, and now we only have one. And so we have the elections coming in November. The interesting thing is one young lady started an Instagram account highlighting all the female um, candidates and urging female candidates and also asking people to nominate women they think that that should go to office. So one doesn't have to do a big thing. It's a small thing. And oh my God, the following is growing and more people are engaging. And so what you need to do, no matter how small your voice is, is to highlight what you would like and you will find that people will join you. Social media is a very powerful tool for misinformation, but also for campaigning. And so getting politicians to hear, in Kuwait, Twitter is a policymaker. When things escalate on Twitter, the government changes its stance, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever side you look at it. So the least one can do is not really rant on social media, but, you know, continue, continue, continue. And if, if it's the right thing, people will gather with them. And if it's not, it'll die. But one has to do something. Social media is a powerful tool not to be sidetracked. I, I, that's what my belief is, definitely for the Arab world. We have a very interesting question about um, that the pandemic has also shown just how thin the veneer is of um, the, the amount of control that women have on their lives and that it, we now know again how just how quickly women are forced into more care work into being automatically providers of free labor and so on and I, I guess I want to conclude with before I give each panelist um, a bit of time for concluding remarks with the question I guess combined to Anisha and Jock on this on this idea of just how much control women even have how much this call to action is something they can follow so maybe Anisha will will start with you behavioral science which is where you work has puts a lot of emphasis on an individual's experience of where they think control is located and how much they can themselves do. But again, do we even know enough about how women experience the control that they have on their lives during this pandemic? Or what, what do we concretely know? And can we find out quickly somehow so that it can be used? I think that's a really good point, right? And as you said, I think, and it's come up in various flashes during this conversation as well. But just to how I see it, and is that we often forget that women have agency themselves, women have aspirations that they um, try to meet, um, but it's on a different scale for every individual, right? So for somebody in a rural household, that agency and that exercising that agency means a very different thing than what it means to any of us on this panel even. Um, and accounting for that and including that in the data we have uh, or that we collect um, also is important. I think from uh, from the perspective that you mentioned, I think these are important psychological contributions that often go missing when we look at hard statistics. Um, we can say 80% of women are 
engage in unpaid care, um, et cetera, et cetera, but with, without knowing the behavioral motivations and the implications of it, um, we really don't know how to use that data in the first place, right? So I think to your point, Marika, the data doesn't exist in as much depth or nuance as we hope, and it doesn't capture these factors of agency, how to influence agency, how to make space for that agency at different levels. What is, as um, Shikha and Tisar said, like what is so social media across, what are those equivalent platforms in different communities, right? It's not going to be Twitter for everybody. So what, it, what is it for all these different communities that we all work with and how can we um, build on those to make place for like, to have women exercise their agency without, um, without concern. I think that's one part. And then I think there are definitely ways to collect information in a quicker manner. Um, and that's also, I think that's one use of technology that I advocate for um, is finding ways uh, to reach people, to reach people who are in vulnerable settings to reach them quicker, to be able to collect you even just five questions and five detailed insights that could really contribute once everything comes together. We often, um, at least as researchers, focus on very lengthy <laughs> questionnaires and very lengthy questions that we want to ask, but sometimes just being able to ask 200 people five questions is better, um, is going to contribute to what we are missing during this pandemic a lot more. Thank you, Anisha. And maybe so that we don't rush towards the end, Jock, I'll, I'll ask you my question and ask you to combine it with maybe your concluding thoughts as we go through concluding thoughts. But this idea of women's agency is important, but how can it be supported during the pandemic? And what is kind of your immediate suggestion for, for better policies that can work to support knowledge or even action for women who are going through very tough times at the moment? Um, over to you, Jock. Thank you, Marika. Um, yeah, so... While it is important to, to think now and act in the present, uh, there is a case for thinking intergenerational and futuristically as well, such that uh, what we learn from here is something that can be used and utilized to improve lives going into the next generation. I ran a, I ran a, a girl's school, I established a girl's school in my, in my rural village in South Sudan and uh, recently, last time I was there, there were a few girls who have chosen to be to, to dispense information on what girls should do on a daily basis in order to keep in school. Uh, so they have a, a radio, which is not a radio, it's a loudspeaker in the tree and, and with a wire to a room. And, and the one girl will go on it and say, here is what you do to persuade your father not to marry you off at the age of 14. Here is what you do to deal with boys who are aggressive on the, on the road. Uh, here is what you do when one of you goes into menses on campus and she has only one item of clothing to her name, which if she stains it, she would be humiliated to death. And here is what you do, your sisters. You, you, you gather behind her, you escort her out of the campus and you cover her back. And the men who are taunting, the boys who are taunting her, one of you can turn around and tell them, look, if your mother didn't have menses, you would not have been born, and so forth and so on. So there are things that girls do right now that are for themselves, but also uh, into the future to improve women's agency, uh, to speak for themselves and, to, and, and to, to actually advance that idea that I was talking about earlier, that it's not just to improve women's lives. It, it, is, it is so that all of us can move forward as a, a cohesive, better society. And, and one of the girls said that, yes, we, we, our going to a school is not a kind of gender war. And for that this school was for girls' school, but it became a girls' school that also takes boys. Uh, in, in the sense that you emphasize this idea, this is not a gender war. We are not at war with simply saying we, we are better off by being nice to one another, by being equitable in our thinking, by being able to support one another because what, what, what are men going to do with power if women are not following? What are women, where, are, where are women going to go with the power if they have it? They will invest it in their families. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And maybe I'll take that um, optimistic spirit to Jane and say, what, what would you hope to happen on, on the, maybe the Canadian policy level or even an international policy level to make sure that the situations, the, the initiatives that Jock just described don't go unnoticed, but on the contrary, get supported in better ways. I, and that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, we know that 
that uh, over the past six months, you know, a year ago, we never would have dreamed that these kinds of things would be happening. Uh, you know, we, we all just talked about technology earlier. We all understand the importance of it, but we had no idea that it would be like a lifeline for people where people can continue with their education. Um, uh, Shaikh, I think you talked about the, the loneliness that women can feel uh, if they're by themselves. And, and while speaking on 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 uh, Twitter on, on Zoom online is not the best case scenario. It is pretty nice when you haven't seen your friends when you can connect or for people who have family members who are living away and who can connect with them. So we understand that te technology is even far more important than we thought that it would be. Um, so we we have to look at making sure that it's it's available across all of our countries to everybody because it is extremely important. Uh, we have to understand that um, that we have to, you know, people are getting in Canada are saying, well, we're giving out a lot of money to those in need. But if we don't, then there are going to be so many tragedies in our country if we don't. So we do have money being given to people who have lost their jobs because of COVID. If you're in the hospitality industry, if you're in the airline industry and any other numbers of, of, of industry, we're also giving out uh, money for people, usually women, who have had to quit their jobs because of childcare, because schools stopped in Canada in in March, they went back in September, but they 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 stopped in March, and and there were no daycares open. So it's it was the responsibility, I think, of government to start helping people. Uh, the government is providing rent supplements or rent for for businesses who are just not doing the business that they had been doing a year ago to help them keep their business by being. Uh, able to supplement their their rent. So I think there are a lot of things. I think I goes back to early on when we talked about communications, making sure that if the public is going to buy into anything, they have to believe that it's the right thing to do. I didn't love coming back from Ottawa and spending two weeks in my house. I'm I'm sleeping downstairs. My husband is upstairs because we're isolating. But when you understand the importance of it, you're willing to do it. And if you're just getting a list of things from your various levels of government, you have to do this, you have to do that without understanding the importance of it, then people are not going to be paying any attention or some people will, but people won't. So I think going back to what we said earlier, communications and to giving people the tools so that we can it together and those of us who are better off than others being willing to share with the food banks and that are just it's unfortunate when food banks we talk about them booming with business but that's just the way that it is because people are hurting during these times um thank you jane um anisha you mentioned earlier that research doesn't always need to take so long and this is continues to be a situation of both the long haul we know that now and a situation of great urgency so what would be your request really for data collection that allows us to understand much better how women can be helped during this pandemic i think this sounds grand and a dream again but i think we need some sort of world audit on how current data systems are excluding women and linking it to what we've been discussing here how can we make technology itself inclusive right so in the way that we think we are expanding access to technology is that going to systematically leave women out as well um, if you think about it a lot of rural households or even low-income households in urban cities um, they have one smartphone or one phone per household and we know this that there it's usually used by the man at least in a lot of east african and indian and south asian countries um, what what divide sort of does that contribute to if we then push all information through that technology source, right? So I think some focus on ensuring that everything we invest in and everything we um, plan to work towards, how can we ensure that that itself doesn't systematically include the women? How can we ensure that we are reaching women and the women are also reaching us through those sources as well? So I, supporting the technology initiative and like also with the lens of thinking through um, how can we make it not how can how can we not make it more divisive than it might be? Um, I think besides that. We
there are certain topics that often go overlooked and I think have come up in this conversation as well, making systematic and sort of mixed method based data collection approaches um, because the statistics don't always tell us, they tell us the problem exists, but without shedding much light on how to solve for it. So focusing on topics such as hope, trust, motivation, aspiration, self-efficacy, um, all that contribute to how women behave, but also how to collect data from women in the first place. Um, and I think, as you said, Marika, the truth is we need to make these investments now. Um, start and see what we can collect that would help us in the short term, but also keep the long term in mind and hope, as Professor Jock said, with for look towards an intergenerational um, positive effect and hope that either by the next pandemic, fingers crossed it doesn't happen, um, but that we're in a better position uh, regarding how much we know about women's lived experiences than we are now. Thank you very, very much, Anisha. I want to uh, really thank the Honourable and Cordy from the Senate of Canada, Professor Jock Madhujok from Syracuse University and Anisha Singh, the Director for Research and Innovation at the Bussar Centre, because I think we've achieved what we set out to do, which is to, to approach this huge topic of how this pandemic affects women and what that means for the support they, they need to be given to help improve everyone's lives. Um, we've approached it from many different perspectives and had some very concrete ideas of what could actually be, be, be done and what still continues to be overlooked, even though these are some kind of concrete solutions. So I really want to thank you for those contributions and um, want to hand over to the co-champion of this um, of this Victoria Forum webinar for her concluding thoughts. So um, Her Highness Sheikha Indisa Al Sabah, what, what do you take away from this? What is your positive and maybe your call to action from this conversation? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to thank all the amazing panelists. I've learned so much just from listening to you. Um, and I started writing what your calls of act for action have, were, but since you've set them at the end, I will go back to my call of action, which is to support women or to bridge the divide between men and women. We have to, we have to, we have to fill the women with their self-worth enough for them to ask for what they want. And if we look at, I will only say disempowered women or women who are not, or in countries where women are not where they should be, where they're not as powerful as they should be. Uh, my call of action would be to support the women to feel their worth, to use whatever psychological interventions we can do to make them realize their potential and realize their worth, and they will get their rights. Because no matter how much policy changes we make, no matter how much we tell them, you should do this, you should do that. If they don't feel it on the inside, if they don't know that this is their right, they will not go for it. And I've seen that with, with, with our women. They've done all these um, courses and all these seminars, they've gone to these seminars where they tell them you have equal rights, you have equal rights. It just does not integrate in their systems because if you think of women for hundreds, if not thousands of years, we've been considered second best. What makes us think that without filling their internal value, their mind will get it? So. To bridge that gap, we have to bridge the vacancies in the women. And that can only come with strong psychological support, with different ways of psychological support. I've seen firsthand that drama therapy works because it, it, it is a model that makes them raise their voices and put themselves in other people's shoes. So it does work. So, Speaking up is what makes women realize that they have a voice, that they are worthy, and they are equal to men. So first and foremost, fill the woman from the inside. She will get what, what she um, is worth. And that's my final remark. So thank you so much, everyone. And I'll hand this over to Adele to do the closing remarks.
Thank you very much, Your Highness. And um, it is it is with uh, great pleasure and um, interest that I followed this conversation. And um, unfortunately, it, is, it, it came to, to an end. So uh, let me, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, this conversation will continue um, during the virtual Victoria Forum. And um, let me share with you my slides. Um, it is it is really uh, important conversation that we started today. So uh, on the on behalf of the Victoria Forum, uh, I would like to thank uh, Marieke, um, uh, Your Highness Antisar um, Sabah, uh, and uh, Senator Jane Cordy, Miss um, Anissa Singh, and Dr. Jock Madujak for for this really amazing conversation. Um, you opened our eyes on, on different kind of issues that we have to address. And I think something that we, we it is dear to our heart in the Victoria Forum is really working together for making the world a better place. And women with women, uh, we, we encourage developing uh, collaborative uh, and um, uh, inclusive relationship to address inequalities and justice and exclusion. Uh, je suis Adèle Guitoni, je suis le uh, associate co-chair de Victoria Forum. Um, et c'est avec grand plaisir et honneur que je dois remercier uh, nos panelistes. C'était une excellente conversation qui a ouvert nos yeux sur l'importance de uh, combler les, les clivages entre les sexes et surtout pour essayer de travailler ensemble pour un monde meilleur qui est plus équitable, plus juste et plus uh, inclusif. Um, it was um, uh, an amazing journey putting together this uh, program and I thank uh, and I'm honored actually for working with uh, Marieke and uh, Her Highness uh, Ntisar for uh, uh, in, in uh, framing the conversation and deciding the panelists. Um, uh, the good news is uh, Marieke and Her Highness uh, Ntisar Subah both uh, agreed to continue this conversation and there will be a round table on the same topic in about a month from now. So uh, uh, please uh, be tuned to the announcement that you will receive from us. Um, we recognize the uh, partnership with uh, Busara Center and Intisar Foundation uh, for, as, as our partners for, for this uh, webinar. Um, et c'est avec grand plaisir que j'annonce le prochain qui va être le dernier de 2020. Uh, c'est le 29 octobre sur le, euh, le climat, les déplacements et le développement, et surtout, c'est une perspective de l'Asie. So the next webinar, which is uh, scheduled for October 29th, is, a, is on climate displacement and development, but a ve with very specific perspective from Asia. So please join us and, and, and uh, um, book this date on, on your calendar. As well, in November, we will hold our um, uh, virtual Victoria Forum. So a set of webinars and a set of uh, round tables are already in the schedule. And today we'll open the registration. So please um, uh, chill and uh, join us for uh, a, continu a continuation of this conversation. And the virtual, virtual Victoria Forum has a mandate is to articulate a very specific uh, set of recommendations and call to action. So the conversation uh, we're trying to, to move um, toward the solutions. Um, all of our events are co-organized between the University of Victoria and the Senate of Canada. Nous reconnaissons et nous sommes très heureux de notre, part notre partenariat avec le Sénat du Canada. Et uh, nous uh, remercions les, les généraux uh, partenaires fondateurs de, uh, de Victoria Forum, uh, Talos and Van City. So I hope you will continue to be engaged with us and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar and the virtual Victoria Forum. Thank you.